So he wants to vindicate the use of reason in its proper role. Now, one of the keys here in providing a critique of pure reason is that, well, you might ask, what's the source of this critique? How are we going to go about establishing the limits of pure reason and vindicating of vindication of reason within those limits? And the answer is reason itself. And this is a very important point for Kant. And so um, if you look at the handout that I gave you, um, on the second page, the second to last quote there, he says, so this is from near the end of the first critique of pure reason. He says, reason must subject itself to critique in all its undertakings and cannot restrict the freedom of critique through any prohibition without damaging itself and drawing upon itself a disadvantageous suspicion. Through any prohibition, he means like prohibition from religious consideration. Now, there's nothing so important because of its utility, nothing so holy, that it may be exempted from the searching review and inspection, which knows no respect for persons and for authority of some position of authority, for example. The very existence of reason, the very existence of reason, depends upon this freedom to critique itself without limitation, which has no dictatorial authority, but whose claim is never anything more than the agreement of free citizens, each of whom must be able to express his reservations, indeed even his veto, without holding back. So this idea of, well, that idea of reason, specifically in this deployment as critiquing itself, is something that's unrestricted, open to anybody to participate, um, whatever their position of Okay, uh, and I'm not going to read you the next quote, the last one on this handout, but this is from um, an essay from 1784 called What is Enlightenment? And this also has um, a very vigorous defense of the sort of open and public nature of reason. Okay, so the very first thing that he says in the preface to the first edition of the particular reason is this. So this is the first line, first quote on your handout. He says, human reason has the peculiar fate in one species of its cognitions that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss since they are given to it as problems by the nature of reason itself, but which it cannot, it also cannot answer since they transcend every capacity of human reason. And later in the preface, he says, to the second quote here, the ripened power of judgment will no longer be put off with illusory knowledge. Uh, it demands that reason should take on anew the most difficult of all tasks, namely that of self-knowledge, and to institute a court of justice by which reason may secure its rightful claims, by which reason may secure its rightful claims, while dismissing all its groundless pre pretensions going beyond its proper limits. Uh, and this court, uh, I'm sorry, and it should do this, not by mere decrees, but according to its own eternal and unchangeable laws, by reason itself. And this court is none other than the critique of pure reason itself. Okay. So pure reason is going to establish the limit, its own limits, and vindicate itself within those uh, within those lines. Okay, so, so Kant rejects, as I said, um, both the traditional rationalist view um, in which reason alone can generate substantive, I said, metaphysical knowledge, but also he rejects the empiricist claim that all knowledge comes um, from experience. And so as he says in the um, introduction to the second edition, so this is now the one, two, three, four, fifth quote on this page. He says, there's no doubt whatever 
that all of our cognition, all of our knowledge, begins with experience, just like the empiricists say. But although our cognition, he says, commences with experience, it does not on that account arise from experience, unlike what the empiricists say. For it could well be, and this is what he's going to argue, this is going to the introduction, this is the point. It could well be that even our experiential cognition, even what we get from experience, is a composite of that which we receive through impressions and that which our own cognitive faculty, merely prompted by sensible impressions, provides out of itself, which addition we cannot distinguish from the fundamental material until long practice has made us attentive to it and skilled in separating it out. So experience, our experiences, he's suggesting here, is the joint product of our impressions from the world and our um, contribution from our mind. Um, so in rejecting the empiricists, he thinks we can have, we are able to have a priori knowledge. But that's because we can know a priori what our own mind is going to provide to experience. But contrary to the rationalists, we can only have that knowledge, we can only have that pure a priori knowledge as applied to objects of possible experience. Or if you don't like him rejecting each, he accepts aspects of both the empiricists and the rationalists. So the story, and here I have to be very, very, very brief, goes something like this. Um, sorry. All cognition mixes with experience, yet it does not on that account all arise from experience. Why doesn't it all arise from experience? No, that's not the point here. So uh, it's certainly true that we're fallible. It's certainly true that our empirical knowledge may be mistaken. But that's not what he means by, I mean, when we do have genuine knowledge, it says, he says it commences with experience, yet that genuine knowledge does not necessarily all arise from experience. Uh, some, of the, some of the categories like uh, causality, modality, we don't experience directly. We don't experience directly. Like, where do they come from? They come from the minds. They come from the minds. From us. So these are things that we can know a priori will be true of any possible experience because they come from us. So that's what we use. So the story goes this way. Um, it begins with what he calls the transcendental aesthetic. So this is the theory of sensibility, the theory of empirical sensation. Um, and he argues here that all of our particular experiences, all of our experiences, all of our empirical intuitions are necessarily in uh, spatial and temporal form. So we can know, so the, the, the so-called form of outer sense, the way that we experience any external object is spatially located. And the form of inner sense is time. So as we reflect on our own thoughts, we know a priori that they are going to be sequential in time, our own sequence of thoughts. Um, okay, and we can know this a priori because they are the forms of um, the forms of intuition are provided by our minds. Um, I want to mention again this idea of inner sense because it's very important for Kant that we have reflective 
experiences of our own mental state, our own mental contents. Um, so it's not just that we have experience of our bodies. Our bodies, as we experience them, are spatially located. The contents of our mind, as we experience them, that's the point of talking about inner sense, are temporally located, are, are temporally sequenced. Um, and uh, it's very important for Kant's theoretical philosophy that we can know a priori that our um, subjective mental states are going to be temporally sequenced in this way. Um, but for us, what's even more important than that is that for Kant, we don't have, we do not have infallible access, infallible experience of our own mental content. We have experience of them, of our own mental contents, through inner sense. So this is a very powerful rejection of Descartes. This is a very powerful rejection of Cartesian philosophy of mind, where our own mental contents, some of them anyway, are um, clear and distinct, or transparent to us. We know with certainty what their content is. Um, but Kant is rejected. Okay, so we can have, I say it again, we can have a priori knowledge using pure reason to say that any experience, any outer experience of an object that we have, Anything that we could possibly have a sensory impression of through outer sense, we know a priori that it will be located somewhere in space. And we know that because we provide that form of experience. So this is what he's saying. If intuition has to conform to the constitution of the object, then I don't see how we can know anything of them a priori. But if the object, as the object of the senses, conforms to the constitution of our faculty of intuition, then I can very well represent this possibility of a priori knowledge um, to myself. Okay, so we can form synthetic a priori statements. A priori statements that have genuine content, genuine knowledge about all the objects of possible experience. And this is exactly how he thinks about mathematical knowledge. So I gave you the example of um, the, the, the um, claim that through a vertex of a triangle there's going to be one line parallel to the opposite base. That's a substantive claim. It's not that you can't you can't prove that simply by the definition of a triangle. How is that substantive knowledge possible a priori? Well, because we know a priori something about the form of our um, intuition about uh, an external object. So we know a priori this is going to have certain spatial character characteristics because we provide